Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Johan Hari, former columnist for The Independent of London and author of the New York Times bestseller, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Johan. Oh, I'm really excited to be with you guys. Thank you. Now, we have a, a war on drugs that's throughout the world to a different extent, um, to a greater or less extent, uh, which is sort of a secondary prob- uh, product of prohibition. And a lot of people don't even know about the history of prohibition, how these drugs even came to be illegal in the first place. So as a sort of general question, and you can choose any specific drug or, or as a general concept, how did drug prohibition begin in the first place? You know, there were so many things when I started researching my book that I had no idea about. You know, I had this quite personal motivation to look into it. Um, we had drug addiction in my family. One of my, one of my earliest relatives, uh, one of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And that's really why I started the doing the research that led me to kind of go to 12 different countries and, and travel 30,000 miles and just sit with loads of different people whose lives have been changed either by the war on drugs or the alternatives to the war on drugs. So I met a kind of mad mixture of people from a crack dealer in Brooklyn to a hitman for the deadliest Mexican drug cartel to uh, the people who led their country to become the first one to decriminalize all drugs. Um, and I discovered that just so many of the things that we take for granted are just wrong. So many things. So if you'd said to me at the start, why were drugs banned 100 years ago? I would have guessed uh, they're the reasons that if you stopped a random American in the street today and you said, why are drugs banned? They'd, they'd probably say, well, we don't want people to become addicted. We don't want kids to use drugs. And um, what's fascinating, if you go back and look at why it all happens, is that stuff barely came up. That's not why drugs were banned. It's not even mentioned in most of the debates. The reasons why drugs were banned uh, is because, as the people would have put it at the time, they believed that blacks and Chinese people were forgetting their place, using drugs and attacking white people. I actually opened the book with a place that might seem a bit uh, weird to open a history of the, a book about the war on drugs, but I opened with this, this, I think, a really significant moment in the war on drugs. In 1939, Billie Holiday stood on stage in midtown Manhattan and she sang the song Strange Fruit, which I'm guessing most people listening to this know it's the song again. Very subversive. Very subversive song, yes. Yeah, that's exactly what her goddaughter Lorraine Feather said to me. She said, you've got to understand how subversive that was to have an African-American woman standing in front of a white audience in a hotel where she wasn't even allowed to walk through the front door. She had to go through the service elevator and sing a song a kind of indictment of American white supremacy. It's kind of, you know, incredibly brave. And that night, Billie Holiday gets a warning from the man who launched, the the man who, the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and basically the man who invented the modern war on drugs, a man called Harry Anslinger. And it basically said, look, stop singing this song. And Billie Holiday said, effectively, screw you, I'm an American citizen, I'll do what I want. And at that point, he decides to begin really destroying her and um, I tell the story in the book of how he stalked and, and played a role in her, in her death. I can tell you about it if you like. But I think that, that tells you so much about what the war on drugs was about right from the start. Well, how explicit was this? Because a lot of the time when we're talking about this crushing racism that motivated a lot of American lawmaking in the early parts of the 20th century, it's kind of under the table or hidden. It's, you know, our, the real goal is to prevent Chinese – laundries from operating but what we're going to instead do is say it's to ban certain ways that laundries might operate that are dangerous that really just happen to align with the Chinese is – were they explicitly saying like as discussing these laws or as writing these laws or writing about them, we need to do this because blacks and other minorities are forgetting their place or was that the – Subtext. The subtext and they had a more – perhaps lofty sounding reason that they expressed. The thing that absolutely amazed me is that it's not subtext at all. A typical official statement was the cocaine N-word sure is hard to kill. Um, You know, Harry Anslinger used the N-word so often in his own official memos that his own senator in the 1920s said he should have to resign. I mean, this is not subtext. This is text to, to a really startling degree when you actually go into the archives and look at it. And it's worth explaining, I think, a bit about the role that Brace played in, in terms of Anslinger himself. So 
I think Harry Anslinger is the most influential person who no one's ever heard of. He's, he, he, he takes over the Department of Prohibition in the late 1920s, just as alcohol prohibition is ending. So he inherits this big government bureaucracy with nothing to do uh, that's actually just been discredited. It's incredibly corrupt. It's obviously lost the war on alcohol massively. And he realises that alcohol prohibition is going to end fairly soon. And he effectively builds the modern war on drugs i'm sure he i mean he did genuinely believe in these things but he wanted to keep his government department going and he really builds he's the first person to use the phrase warfare against drugs long before nixon and he really builds it around these two obsessive hatreds that he has one is a hatred of of addicts based on some stuff that happened to him when he was a kid and one was a really intense hatred of african-americans as i say he is regarded as a mad racist in the 1920s um, and this is regarded as a racist enterprise at the time, which is quite surprising, actually. Now, you can kind of go through the different drugs and say heroin, Chinese people. I mean, that, that's for example, because I think you have a line in the book, if I'm remembering correctly, that the common user of heroin in, say, 1905 was a, a housewife drinking a, a tincture. Well, not heroin. Heroin is a brand name for bear, but a tincture of opium of some sort uh, that make you feel better with a little bit amount of opium in it. But then when the Chinese get associated with it, uh, the entire narrative changes. That, that when it can be racialized, it, 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 the, the move to ban it is, is a project of, ra- of racializing it. So uh, again, you're totally right. The opiates are regarded as this thing that's been brought by the Chinese – Cocaine is regarded as African-American. Cannabis or m- marijuana is regarded as uh, something that's been brought up by Hispanics from uh, Latinos from, from Mexico. Cannabis is an interesting example because Anslinger had actually said on the record officially that he did not regard ca- – because bear in mind when he takes over the Department of Prohibition, cannabis is still legal in the United States. And he had was on the record saying it's not a harmful drug, not bothered by it. And it, when he then begins to build his war against drugs – Cocaine and heroin were really minority tastes in the US at that time. You can't really build much of a government bureaucracy around cocaine and heroin because it's a tiny trade. And that's when he suddenly announces that cannabis is, in fact, worse than heroin, um, worse than any drug, um, that, it, that it, it invariably causes psychosis. And he, he picks up on this particular case. It's very interesting. There's, there's a, a boy in Florida called Victor Lacarta, who was 21, hacked his family to death with an axe. And along with the Hearst, Hearst newspapers, who were the kind of Fox News of the day, he creates this huge hysteria. Which says, this is what will happen if you smoke weed. And, um, and, and in light of this panic, cannabis is banned. Years later, someone went back and looked at the files, for the psychiatric files for Victor Licata. There's not even any evidence he used cannabis. He, he, he'd, his parents had actually been told to institutionalise him several years before, but they wanted to keep him at home. There was insanity in his family. It, 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 the whole thing was a kind of bogus... Uh, hysteria but of course it worked in the sense that Anslinger then has this huge department because of course cannabis is it was even then much more widespread than than heroin and cocaine uh but you're right it's not a coincidence that Victor Licata is Latino well there's an interesting uh parallel which I did not see in your book and I was wondering like absinthe in Europe was actually prohibited for a another axe murder um in in the 1905 I think that it's called the Lefay murders a guy in Switzerland murdered a bunch of his family in a similar thing and the story became that he was on absinthe and therefore lost his mind. And so then the prohibition of absinthe as a uniquely dangerous alcohol with wormwood or whatever swept across Europe. And this seems to another be a, a constant theme is that we say that some drug is just really going to take over your autonomy and turn you into a raving psychopath. Uh, we had this with bath salts in the United States recently and that that's why we need to prohibit it. But there's always this racial overtone to it also. Yeah, this belief skips from drug to drug. As it becomes discredited with one drug, it skips to the next. So enough people know enough people have used cannabis that, you know, you can't credibly say that about cannabis anymore. So the idea skips to cocaine. Now enough people know enough people who've used cocaine that you know what it doesn't ever use. Like, so it skips from drug to drug. It's a misunderstanding of both drugs and mental illness to think that, you know, one drug invariably makes people insane and so on. It's a misunderstanding of, of how those things work. But you're right, it skips around. Does this mean, though, that they aren't dangerous? I mean, so when I was a kid, I remember the one that was super scary was PCP. Superman. Like, like yeah, it was, Hulk, it, Hulk drugs. It was the one that made you insane and they had to shoot you in the kneecaps to get you to stop. Um, 
So is it – with something like PCP, is that just totally made up or is there is there any truth to this stuff is actually can make you nuts or dangerous? The two things that – this is the thing that most surprised me in my research as I mentioned um, – the, one of the reasons why I cared about this subject and why I spent so much time learning about it is because we had addiction in my family and my family's experience with drugs was catastrophic. And um, it's very tempting to generalise from your own experience. And I kind of assumed, you know, a very, very large portion of people who use drugs like heroin develop really serious problems or drugs like meth. And... I think the, the two things that most surprised me in the research are, firstly, what a small proportion of drug users are harmed by the drug. It's definitely not zero, and it's really important to say that. Um, and secondly, what really causes addiction, and this that really kind of blew my mind, actually. The, the, so to start with the first point, um, so we all know this with alcohol, right? You can go into a bar in D.C. tonight, and you know, you're going to know that there are people there. You look around you and you know that most of the people in that bar, the vast majority, 90%, if it's a typical bar, will be, you know, drinking alcohol because it makes their life better. They're having a good night. They're relaxing and so on. Um, and there will there may be some small minority who have an alcohol problem, in which case they need our love and support. We all know that. What was really striking to me, and I actually learned this from data that was given to me by Professor Carl Hart, which frankly I didn't believe when he first gave it to me and I really had to look at it in a lot of detail, Actually, that ratio seems to be true for virtually all drugs. 90% of people who use meth don't become addicted to meth. 90% of people who use crack don't become addicted to crack. Now, it can cause other health problems and, uh, and, and other things. I'm not saying those drugs are a good thing or people should use them. But the, the, thing that, the obvious question that begs is, well, hang on, what's going on with the 10% where something does go wrong? And to me, that was the, the most fascinating bit. So if you had said to me, you know, five years ago when I started this research, what causes, say, heroin addiction, to choose the one that, you know, happened to be closest to me, I would have looked at you like you were an idiot. And I would have said, well, the clue's in the name, right? Using it's heroin, called- yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stupid question, right? Um, you know, we've been told this story for 100 years that has become part of our common sense. It was definitely part of my common sense, which is, you know, we think if you ca- if you kidnap the next 20 people who walk past you know, the Cato Institute offices, right? And you made them all use heroin together for a month. At the end, they'd it's all be... described our intern program. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't let that out, Aaron. <laughs> it were your poor interns, yeah. kids forced to use smack. At the end of, say, a month, of how long internship lasts, they would all be heroin addicts, right? And we think we know that for a simple reason. That for, we think we know why that would be, that, that there are chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to physically need. And so at the end of that month, they'd have this ravenous craving for heroin. The first thing that alerted me to the fact there's something not right about that story is when it was explained to me in Canada or most of Europe. So say I'm in London at the moment, I'm about to come back to the US. If I step out of th- at the end of this interview and I get hit by a truck and I break my hip, I'll be taken to hospital and I'll be given loads of a drug called diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's just the medical name for heroin. Actually, they give me much better heroin than I could ever get from a drug dealer because it'd be medically pure. It'd be 100% heroin, whereas what a dealer sells you is very little of it is actually heroin. All over Europe and all over Canada, the whole time people are being given heroin in hospital. If you, if you have a European grandmother and she's ever had a hip replacement operation, she's taken a lot of heroin. So they're exposed to all the same chemical hooks as any addict you're going to see on the street, Right. If what we think about addiction is right, that it's caused by the chemical hooks, what should happen to all these people in hospital? Some of them should become heroinites. This has been studied very carefully. It virtually never happens. And when I learned that, it seemed um, so weird and so contrary to everything I'd been told. Again, I didn't really believe it. And I only really began to understand it when I went to Vancouver and met this incredible man called Professor Bruce Alexander, who's done this experiment that has opened up a whole world of science and experiments on humans experiments looking at humans that i think really should change how we think about addiction so professor alexander explained to me this theory of addiction that we all have in our heads about chemical hooks comes partly from a series of experiments that that were done earlier in the 20th century they're really simple experiments the cato institute could stage them and put them on youtube uh, anyone listening to this can try it at home tonight if they feel a bit sadistic you get a rat and you put it in a cage, and you give it two water bottles. One is just water, and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, 
the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself. Do you guys remember the oh, yeah. famous uh, th- we had we had a thing called dare in school i think aaron had you had that right drug abuse resistance education which pretty much just told us all these sort of you know these are the worst things ever you'll be addicted immediately which i i believed until recently so the the rats experiment i remember watching that in a film strip in sixth grade i believe yeah and you can see it on youtube and it kind of shows you that that experiment but in the 70s so actually by the time you were shown that this had already been proven but in the 70s professor alexander came along and said hang on a minute, you put this rat alone in an empty cage where it's got nothing to do except use the drugs. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which had loads of cheese, loads of coloured balls, loads of tunnels, loads, the rat had loads of friends, they could have loads of sex. Anything a rat wants in life is there in Rat Park, right? And they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water, and they of course try both because they don't know what's in them. But this is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. So you go from almost 100% overdose when the environment is shitty and they're isolated to no overdose when they have a good and, and valuable life. There's loads of human examples I can talk about about that. But to me, what that tells you is the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. So this is this is fascinating because I think that the – the big takeaway that I got from your book, I mean, we've gone into it in different ways here, is that the primary driver of the drug war has been people's perceptions of what a drug user is like, either of race or class, and then their perceptions of what a drug does. And in pretty much every instance of this, when you ask them the question of why is something prohibited when something else is allowed, why is alcohol allowed but marijuana prohibited? And if you have a government that doesn't have libertarian principles, meaning it it thinks that it can in principle ban anything, then what actually decides whether or not something is prohibited or whether it's allowed is sort of whether or not the people in power take that drug, uh, use it or know people who use it or have some sort of accurate depiction of what – heroin use is like or what alcohol use is like or what marijuana use is like. And the single biggest thing that happened with marijuana is that people, as you mentioned, started knowing people who took marijuana and they started knowing people who did cocaine. And so that changed the perception of the drug user. But the big drivers is the perception of the drug user and the perception of the drug. That's interesting. I think there's some truth in that. I don't think it's the main reason. Uh, Or rather, I think it may be – it's a crucial factor in how the war is sold. But I don't think – because actually it's very interesting if you look at – it's the best way to explain this. I don't think you need to challenge how people think about drug users to change how they think about the drug war necessarily. And I think Switzerland is an interesting – there's a few places that are interesting examples of this because I actually think the, the worst harms caused by the drug war are – totally different to what we've been talking about. I think, obviously, I care massively about what we've been talking about. I actually think the biggest harm is a whole other thing, um, and it's by far the most devastating effect of the war on drugs, even more than the massive and unnecessary death of addicts and the terrible addiction crisis, and even more than the mass imprisonment. It's the violence caused by prohibition itself, which is destroying whole countries um, so, and, and causing catastrophic violence in the city that you're in at the moment, in Anacostia and you know, uh, east of the river and, and across the United States. And I think it's worth explaining this to people. I mean, I learned about it mainly from a, as I said, a transgender crack dealer in Brooklyn and a hitman from the Mexican drug cartel, and actually from a guy who does amazing research for Cato, um, Professor Jeffrey Myron at, at Harvard, who, who's uh, an associate fellow of yours, mm-hmm. who, who's done absolutely amazing work on this. And I think everyone at Cato should be incredibly proud of him. Best way to explain it is, again, do a little experiment, right? Your listeners can do this. While you're listening to this podcast, go and try to steal a bottle of vodka. And if the liquor store catches you, they'll call the police and the police will come and take you away. So that liquor store doesn't need to be violent. It doesn't need to be intimidating because they've got the power of the law to uphold their property rights. Now do a different experiment. Go and try to steal a bag of weed or a bag of Coke, assuming you're not in um, Colorado or Washington or Oregon. If that guy who sells that catches you, Obviously, he can't ring the police, right? The police would come and arrest him. He has to fight you. 
In fact, he has to establish a reputation for being such a badass that no one would be so stupid as to try to steal from him. And he has to establish his place in that neighborhood through <coughs> violence and intimidation. There's a writer who said that the war on drugs creates a war for drugs. Uh, Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, calculated there are 10,000 additional murders every year in the United States as a result of that dynamic. I, I reported uh, for Chasing the Scream, I report on from northern Mexico, and as I said, just came back from Colombia, from Ciudad Juarez, um, where, you know, it's worth remembering, more people have died in the drug war violence in Mexico and Colombia than have died in the civil war in Syria. And there may not be that much we can do about the war in Syria, we should talk about it, but we could end this violence. And if you want to know how we can end it, just ask yourself, where are the violent alcohol dealers today? Does the head of Heineken go and shoot the head of cause in the face? You know, does does like the, the you know does does your local liquor store send the teenagers who work there to go and kill the people at another liquor store? Of course not. That's exactly what happened under alcohol prohibition. Everyone listening to this knows who Al Capone is. Everyone listening to it knows who Pablo Escobar is. I bet none of you know the name of the head of Heineken or Smirnoff, and I bet you don't care because it's a legal regulated business that doesn't create violence. Oh okay, yeah, but so that's. That's one narrative and it's a very it's a it's a common one and it's one that we at Cato talk about a lot, but <clears throat> when it gets made there's a there's a counter narrative that gets made by especially more conservative people that says, look, the world has violent people in it. It has people who will shoot each other in the face over nothing, and sometimes that's cultural, sometimes that's just part of who they are, that it, it can get Certain communities seem to have more of it than others and that that's the drive of the violence and the drugs is just what they're latching on to. So they latched on to alcohol prohibition and there was a lot of violence around that and if you get rid of that, then they're going to latch on to drugs because that's something they can be violent around. But if you get rid of drugs, it's just going to be something else. And so the violence is not being caused by the prohibition. It's just that the prohibition is where the violence moves to because that's the most convenient spot. Yeah, and we can measure this. So um, th there's a simple way of answering that, which is to look at a graph that Jeffrey Myron, um, your associate at Harvard professor, um, shows. Uh, it's a graph of the murder rate in the United States in the 20th century. It massively spikes up when alcohol is banned, and it collapses when alcohol prohibition ends. And it massively spikes up again in the 70s when, when drug prohibition is intensified under Nixon. I don't want to say that it's important to stress that's not the only reason why it spikes up in the 70s, but it's, it's a contributory factor. Uh, you know, there's basically two ways to think about this, isn't there? There's the quantity theory of crime. I think of it this way, which is that like certain inherent proportion of people are just criminals. And then there's the incentive theory of crime, which is, well, you know, there's plenty of people who wouldn't normally commit a crime, but if you offered them a fair incentive to do it, they consider it. And I think everyone listening to this knows that the incentive theory of crime is obviously true, right? I, I would not go and, I don't know, push over an old woman. If you offered me a billion dollars to do it, I would think about it. I'd like to think I'd still say no. Um, you know, I, I hope I'd still say no. But, you know, there are lots of people listening to this will know there are crimes they would not just commit of their own volition. But if you offered them loads of money to do it, they would probably do it. If we had someone like Bill Bennett come in, a former uh, drug, very big hardy drug warrior um, and say – so he wouldn't disagree with you that the drug war causes violence because people do violent things for things that are legal. But that doesn't actually answer the question of whether or not drugs should be legal because that question is about whether drugs are the kind of things that – people should be doing or that the government should at all be OK with people doing in the sense that the kind of thing that you res that you end up being if you're a drug taker is an unacceptable thing that the government has a responsibility of standing in, in between you and, and those substances. And if there is illegality that results or violence that results from around this, uh, that's just a product of the government – of people having base motives to try and get things that they shouldn't be getting and the government needs to sort of stand in the way and make sure that that doesn't happen if is the best we can able to do. Yeah, I think there's – I think you're right and that does bolster your case that you have to change how people think about drug users and I do think there's a case for doing that. But I guess there's a, a few things you could say in response to that. Firstly, there's a question of scale. Let's, let's grant – I don't agree with it but let's grant the idea that you know it would be a desirable thing – to um, you know, prevent people from choosing to use drugs if they want to, right? Would it be worth losing ten thousand Americans every year to do that? 
would it be worth losing more than 100,000 Mexicans to do that? So once you factor in the violence, and it's worth remembering, you know, I, there's a quote that I think every American taxpayer should know. I think it's a scandal. Michelle Leonhardt, who was the head of the DEA until relatively recently, was asked in a, in a, by a Senate subcommittee um, what she thought about the fact that 60,000 innocent Mexicans had died in the drug war violence. Actually, it was a much higher, that figure they put to her was wrong. It's, it's been more death than that, but that's what they put to her. And she said, these were her exact words, it's a sign of success in the war on drugs. <laughs> you know, I mean, that ordinary Americans are so much better than that. That's, that's really, if I think about the people that I got to know in, in, in northern Mexico who had lost people in the most unbelievably terrible ways, um, you know, beheading and butchery. And, you know, I, I, as I said, I got to know a hitman who, who had, in fact, between the ages of 13 and 17, butchered or beheaded about 70 people. Uh, he, he actually was an American kid who'd grown up in, in Laredo, um, you know, uh, obviously on the border of, with Mexico. Um, you know, so I think once you factor in the... Insert, now, I do agree that... I think, so even if you grant this, this, this demonised view about drug use... I still think the violence would ending that violence would outweigh this demonized drug use. But I agree also the demonized drug use is the demonized idea of drug use is is wrong. And I think the other way to challenge that is to talk about what legalization has meant in the places that have tried it. Because it's interesting because it's not the first thing to say is that legalization means different things for different drugs. In the same way that I'm pretty sure that in DC you could own a dog, a monkey, and a lion if you really wanted to. But I'm also sure the rules would be different, right? You've got a, I'm sure you can just go and buy a dog from Monkey, I guess. You might need a license. And it's definitely a lion. You couldn't just have a lion. Zoos can own lions, I guess. But yes, yeah, so different people probably can own those in different ways. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and I think that's a fairly sensible, even, you know, pretty hardcore libertarians would agree having a lion in your yard is not a good, not a good idea, right? <laughs> and that there should be a system that's fairly regulated, right? The, the, um, it, it, you can do the same thing with different drugs. So I've been to places where different drugs have been legalized and it means different things. So obviously Colorado, three US states have now legalized marijuana like alcohol. So you've got to be over 21. Um, you know, there's a certain amount you can buy every day. It's taxed. It's a regulated product. Um, Switzerland has legalized heroin and for addicts. And it works very differently. Obviously, you, you, you don't go into the Swiss equivalent of CVS and just buy heroin, right? The way it works is, if you're a heroin addict, you're assigned to a clinic, you go to that clinic, you're given your heroin there, you have to use it there in front of a doctor or a nurse. And then you leave. And what's fascinating is you leave to go to your job because they give you help to get a job and so on. What's fascinating about that is, do you know how many people have died of overdoses on legal heroin in Switzerland? Probably zero. Zero. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Not a single person. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. I know that will be jarring to some people listening to this. The facts are, that's an indisputable fact. Um, it's one of the reasons why Switzerland, which is a super conservative country, voted by 70% to keep heroin legal after they'd seen it in practice because you just saw such a big fall in crime and, you know, you saw addicts just being turned around. But, but um, yeah, so it's important to explain to people that legalization doesn't mean what they think it does. Um, and, you know, I, so I think it, as much it's about, um, I take your point about changing the attitude towards drug users. You know, there's an interesting, there was an interesting debate about this. If you look at Washington and Colorado, the campaigns to legalize marijuana, both successful. And, I, and I'm from Colorado, actually, actually, and Aaron has uh, lived there for a long time, too, so... Did you guys vote in the referendum? No, I was living we were out, but time. I I was in Colorado in actually um, Pueblo, which was one of the the towns that legalized it for sale at the beginning. I was there the day that it went legal and drove by and have pictures of remarkably long lines lined up outside of the um, the dispensaries. It was an event. Well, that has had a real ripple effect across the world amazing ripple effect you know everywhere i went people would talk about what happened there and now and it's it, a non-issue that's the interesting thing too is i mean a lot of people in colorado were already smoking marijuana um if they wanted to because of medical and other sources but it's it's become mundane it's just like all my friends yeah i mean you just go to the store and buy it it's not it's not this crazy thing anymore because they've made it kind of boring I think that's a really important fact. This is one of the things I saw everywhere where they'd moved beyond drugs from Portugal where they decriminalized all drugs to Switzerland where they'd legalized heroin. It's massively controversial when you first do it. And then the effect quite rapidly is, oh, is that it? You know, and people see significant improvements over time. There's nowhere that's done this that hasn't seen a significant increase in support 
after they've seen it in practice, which I think tells you something. But there, there was a really interesting debate between the Colorado and Washington uh, campaigns, well, not debate between them, but a difference of approach. So I, I got to know and interview the people who led both sides, the Colorado and Washington campaigns. And what's interesting is in Colorado, um, guys like Mason Tavert, who led the campaign, who I, I really admire, he led a campaign that was very much about trying to change how people thought about the drug itself, which was saying, uh, you know, um, cannabis isn't what you think it is. It's less harmful than alcohol. Actually, if people transfer from alcohol to cannabis, that's a good thing. In Washington, people like Tonya Winchester, who I hugely admire as well, who led the campaign there, took a totally different approach. When she talked to people, uh, so the way Tonya would explain it is, you know, only 15% of people in Washington smoke cannabis. If what you're trying to do is run a pro-cannabis campaign, you're not going to win. What she did is she said to people when she was out canvassing, I'm not asking if you like cannabis. I don't like cannabis. I don't want to smoke it. The question is not, do you like cannabis? The question is, do you think people's lives should be ruined for smoking cannabis? Do you think we should empower criminal gangs? Do you think we should continue with a situation where drugs are controlled by people who don't check ID and sell as happily to a 13-year-old as a 30-year-old? So she has a different approach. One of the interesting things is they both won. So in a way, I guess both arguments are effective. My personal instinct is more to veer towards Tonya's approach, but I could be wrong. I think they're both true. Well, one of the, my favorite stories you tell in the book, which is related to the conversation we're having right now, is uh, going back to the history of the drug war and two brothers um, named Harry Smith Williams and uh, Edward Williams who were involved in the beginning days of the drug war and were involved with Harry Anslinger. But one of the books uh, written by Harry Smith Williams was this book called Drug Addicts Are Human Beings, which is a – striking title and one thing that we might forget quite often and he seemed to realize in 1938, I think, when the book was written. You know, I thought that was such a kind of crazy, heartbreaking story. One of the reasons why, exactly speaking to that point, one of the, one of the reasons why my book is written largely is the stories of people I got to know or, or people I learned about is because I think this sounds a bit wanky and I don't put it as uh, pretentiously as this in the book, but I basically think the drug war is a, a war that only continues because we've dehumanized all the people involved. We've dehumanized drug users. We've de dehumanized drug addicts. We've dehumanized drug dealers. We've dehumanized the people who live on the supply route countries. We've dehumanized uh, the cops who fight this war. And actually, I think if you really want to end it, you know, one of the reasons I wrote it as stories of people I got to know is because I kind of thought the average American or British person or pretty much anyone, if they met, Chino Hardin, the transgender crack dealer that I got to know, who's one of the most wise and amazing people I've ever met. If they got to know uh, Bud Osborne, the homeless street addict who started an uprising in Vancouver. Um, if they got to know Lee Maddox, the cop in Baltimore who turned against the drug war. They wouldn't say, ah, oh, fuck these people, I don't care, let them die. They would not say that. If they met, they got to know Maricela Escobedo, the woman who, who was looking for her missing daughter in Ciudad Juarez in the middle of the drug war, whose story I tell. They would not say, let them die. I don't care. The job here is to, to rehumanize those people. And the story you mentioned of Henry Smith Williams, I think, is kind of heartbreaking. So he was a doctor back when drugs were, were legal, before there's this crackdown. And he treated some, some opiate addicts. And they were a bit like kind of low-level alcoholics today. So they had jobs. But, you know, they had, a, they had a problem. They would go to the local pharmacy and they would get their – it was called Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup. <laughs> it was kind of mild opiate. And they would, you know, they were addicted to it and it, it debilitated their lives. And then drugs are banned. And suddenly he sees this huge transformation where these patients who previously had controlled but debilitating addictions, suddenly, you know, the, the first thing that happens is the price massively goes up by like, I think it's a thousand percent for opiates. The second thing that happens is milder forms of the drug are no longer available. I can explain why I think that's really important in a minute. Um, and lots of these addicts who been able to hold down jobs and everything. They just lives fall apart. A lot of the women become prostitutes. A lot of the men turn to property crime. You see a huge increase in property crime and you see a huge increase in deaths from, from drugs, partly because the drugs are contaminated because they're much harder drugs than they were before. Um, and he's like, having previously not been very sympathetic to addicts. I mean, he was really, he didn't like them at all. He kind of used almost eugenical language about addicts. Yeah, exactly. They'd be, we'd be better off if they'd never been born, that mm -hmm. kind of thing he said. Suddenly, you know, he's confronted with seeing all these people die and almost the logic of what he'd said before drugs were banned. And he just 
couldn't stomach it. And so he begins to speak out. He's part of a wave of doctors who insist on, continu- on prescribing heroin to their patients, giving heroin legally to patients, because they there was deliberately a loophole written into the law when drugs are banned by the senators, which basically said, this is meant to apply to recreational drug use, but doctors can basically do what they want. So Henry Smith Williams was one of thousands of doctors across the United States who said, well, look, we're just going to carry on prescribing, and because they didn't want their patients to die going to criminals. And what happened to him next, I think, is... You, you know, almost unbelievable that he's arre- that uh, his brother is arrested. His brother was a prescribing doctor. It's the biggest roundup of doctors in American history. Seventeen thousand doctors are busted. That basically accused of being drug dealers. Is this Harry Anslinger again? Yeah, Anslinger leads that. Anslinger, uh, just before he starts stalking Billie Holiday and then plays a role in her death, he he obsessively destroys these doctors. Um, you know, the, the, it's a mass breaking of doctors. There's a big rebellion against it in the US. The mayor of Los Angeles goes and stands in front of a heroin prescribing clinic and basically says, you will not shut down this clinic. This does a good job for the people of the United States. There's actually a crazy story about what it, so it, and it's closed down. That loophole is shut down state by state. And California, where Henry Smith Williams was, is the state that holds out longest. And it's really interesting why, I I find this extraordinary, why um, California does shut it down. It turns out the local Chinese drug gangs were really pissed off because in Nevada, the heroin prescription had been shut down. So if you were a drug addict, you had to go to the drug gangs. But in California, of course, they could go to Henry Smith Williams and other doctors. So the drug gangs weren't getting much business. So the local Chinese drug gangs bribed the Federal Bureau of Narcotics to introduce the drug war in California to stop doctors prescribing and fully criminalize heroin. Wait, because wait, wait. They, the, they bribed the federal they, – this is insane. Wait, they bribed the agents themselves or the, the top-level people? There's a called Chris Hansen who was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in California. There's a big court case. I got the documents from it. And they bribed him to ban heroin, to fully ban heroin because they got the trade, Right. And there was, it was then revealed a few years later, and there was a court case, and Chris Hansen was sent to prison. But by then, the, the ban was in place, right? Now, that's not the main reason why heroin was banned across the US. I want to stress that. But it does tell you something about who won from the drug war, who had been the only winners from this war all along. Organized crime, armed criminal gangs. So the solution to this, at least in part, is this humanizing of the people involved and the telling their stories. So we can do that in part through your book through and books like yours that present those stories to us but I mean as we're well aware the the best way to humanize people is to actually experience them face to face and get to know them and have repeat interactions with them and so you're a journalist and so it's I mean not only do you have the skills to track these kinds of people down and know how one goes about sitting down with a drug cartel hitman and a Mexican drug runner and dealers and vice cops and so on but it's it's your job to do it. The rest of us don't have either the, the time or the skill set to do it. So how do you – and we're so, we're so separated from these people. You know, it's not like getting to know a – you know, Muslims in your community when you're a Christian where you can just go over to the mosque or whatever. It's, it's harder than that. So how do we go about humanizing these people who are – either part of the criminal element or actively excluded or in profoundly different socioeconomic strata than we are? Yeah, the solution is not for everyone to reach out and meet their local Zeta hitman. (laughs) 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 I had a a slightly weird experience when I went to uh, Rosalio Retta, who's the hitman for the Zetas that I interviewed. When I went to interview him, he's in prison in Tyler County in in Texas. And I had a slightly weird experience on the way in when the uh, the guards said, I can't do a Texan accent, I apologize. The guard on the way in says, you know, like, well obviously we can't leave you on your own with him. He's butchered or beheaded about seventy people. And I was like, oh thank you. And uh, so they might go to the room with him. And then I looked, turned around a few minutes later and they were just gods. <laughs> I was just like, oh thanks very much. But, um, anyway, fortunately I was not beheaded. But he's actually kind of quite weak and feeble when you meet him. But the um but no th- th- that that's not the, the solution. It's worth remembering, you know, almost the vast majority of people who were part of the anti-slavery movement in Britain and the north of the United States had never met a slave. Um, so I don't think you have to personally meet people in order to, I think it helps if you know 
you know, you can debunk, certainly with addiction, everyone listening to this podcast knows someone who's got an addiction problem. And, um, and you have seen a really significant change in, in how we think about addicts in a really short period of time. If you think about, this is the most lowbrow reference I'll ever give, but if you watch something like Cagney and Lacey, um, or those 80s cop shows, quite often in those shows, there are characters who are addicts who are the evil addict, right? Who, who come in and they're like, you know, a, a monster, a ravening monster, and they're the villain of the show, and the fact that they're an addict makes them the villain. That would not happen now. You would not get an episode of CSI where the addict was evil, right? The people just, the culture has shifted in such a way that, that would, people would really balk at that. And that's been a humanising process, um, I think a bit like the gay rights revolution, where people talk about their addictions and people come out, if you like, and there has been this slow humanizing process, which has already begun. Um, so now, even now, you don't have the drug war does massively persecute addicts, but no one defends it in those terms anymore. Very, very few people. Uh, there's actually this move to kind of, and I'm a bit worried about it actually. And I, I, Kato should, might want to, you guys might want to do some research on this. I think there's a kind of defensive rebranding of the drug war. So look at Chris Christie, for example. Chris Christie got a lot of praise for giving a speech in which he says, you know, we need to stop punishing addicts. He talks about his mother having been a smoker and she was never able to give up. And he talks about New Jersey as a model. If you look at what's happening in New Jersey, to give you an example, they've got a prison that, that obviously contained a lot of people who were there because they had drug problems that they've converted into a so-called treatment centre. Now, I haven't looked into that, but um, I strongly suspect it's punitive and shame-based treatment, which is the norm in the United States and is an absolute scandal. But also, you know, yeah, it's slightly better if you're an addict to go into something called a rehab centre, which is an actual form of prison, which is going to tell you that it's because of your moral flaws and shame you. That is a little bit better, but it's still nothing like what they did in Portugal, where they actually halved the heroin problem, for example. I can talk about that if you want. I'm worried that because they know they can't hold the line for defending prohibition, they're going to kind of rebrand prohibition and call it treatment when it's actually not very different to prohibition. And it's still going to be the court mandates you to go to the treatment, so-called treatment. The treatment is still going to be judgment and shame based. It's going to be in an actual fucking prison, right? It's not, you know, it's not that different. Um, so I think it's worth us being really vigilant to that. People announcing they've ended the drug war when actually they're just continuing it by different means. There's one uh, fact, there's so many facts in your book that are jaw dropping in a variety of different ways. Um, and there's one that I want to kind of go back a little bit uh, about because we've been talking about some of the exporting of the U.S. war on drugs. But to bring Harry Anslinger back into this, who is who is the Lex Luthor of the drug war? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, I've rarely – after reading this, I've rarely encountered anyone who's as much of a supervillain as this guy. But <laughs> but the uh, – how he got – and this is this story I would like you to tell. We'll highlight this. How he got Mexico to fight our drug war. Before I tell you that, can I tell you my favorite quote from Harry Anson? Oh, please. At one point, um, at one point he was uh, being challenged by a representative of another country at the, um, well, it was the League of Nations then. And um, actually, no, it would have been the United Nations by then. And uh, a representative of another country is talking about how they don't want to do what he's saying. And he said, um, this is exact words. I've made up my mind. Don't try to confuse me with the facts. <laughs> and to me, that's that's like the perfect motto for the entire war on drugs, isn't it? But no, answering it. So w when they ban drugs in the United States, unsurprisingly, drugs do not disappear. But answering, I had told people that drugs would disappear. So you needed like a uh, a person to blame. And you know, he picks on the you see resonances with politics today. Obviously, he announces it's the Mexicans. Uh, that they're flooding the country with with drugs, and so therefore you have to export the the drug war. It's a bit like Trotsky's idea about revolution. You know, you can't just have revolution in one place; it has to happen everywhere, and you have to export it. And so Anslinger starts um, uh, demanding that other countries fall in line. Obviously, Mexico is the the neighbouring country, and um, Mexico does this really brave thing. They say no. They actually appointed to run their drug policy a, an extraordinary man called Leopoldo Salazar Viniegra, who was a doctor who ran a rehab centre. And if you look at what he said in 1930, I mean, it would be prescient today. He said, we shouldn't ban cannabis because it's not that harmful. 
other drugs, we need to give people love and support. And we mustn't ban drugs because the whole country will be taken over by cartels if we do. I don't think any human being has ever been so vindicated. <laughs> That's pretty good, yeah. Slayer Bolder Salazar Viniegra. Um, and Antonio effectively says, fire this man, get rid of him. And Mexico, again, really bravely says, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep our man. And so the diplomatic pressure has stepped up and stepped up and stepped up over the next few years until in the end, what they did is, um, so opiates for hospital, opiates to use in hospital for medical relief were manufactured, all the ones that were used in in, um, the rest of the Americas were manufactured in the United States. And they cut off the supply of legal opiates to, um, to Mexico. So people started to just die in agony in Mexican hospitals. And in the end, Mexico gave in. They got rid of Leopoldo Salazar de Niegra. They, um, they bring in um, uh, a much more prohibitionist person. And the whole course of Latin America in the 20th century branches at that point. And you end up where, you know, when I went to, to Juarez, you know, with an absolute horror show. Um, and, and this happens all the way through the history of um, Mexico and, and, you know, repeatedly throughout the 20th century, Mexico tries to break from the US line. So you have this moment with that maniac G. Gordon Liddy when in, the, in 1970, when Mexico tries to move towards a more sane drug policy and Liddy, um, what's it called? Operation Intercept, I think it's called. They just search everything that comes across the border from Mexico for like six weeks and it brought the Mexican economy to a standstill and then of course Mexico gives in and begins this catastrophic program of fumigation and all of that. This happens again and again and again and to me you know obviously I talk about lots of different things in the book I talk about the mass incarceration in the in the United States and the catastrophe there about the criminalization of ordinary drug users about the destruction of drug addicts but to me it's what we've done to the supply route countries it's so dev- it's the m- even more devastating than all of them and we've we- basically extorted I mean we we extorted Mexico by basically I mean putting their citizens into pain and we also have made sure that Certain studies. I mean, the America, America in this is just horrible because you write about how a 1995 World Health Organization report about cocaine that said most uses, quote, experimental and occasional, and uh, by, are by far the most common types of use, and compulsive dysfunctional use is far less common. But the U.S. threatened to cut funding to the World Health Organization unless that report was buried. I mean, this seems to happen a lot. We have a huge track record of using our weight to make other people fight our puritanical pathology. Pathologies about the drug war. Yeah, I think you put it really, really well. And there's been um, a real war on science through the drug war as well. A real suppression of scientific research. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, that was that that study you just mentioned is the most detailed scientific study of cocaine use ever. I can't remember the stats, but it's hundreds of scientists looking at enormous numbers of people. And um, really detailed science, and yeah, there was just a massive suppression of it. And again, you saw and it was that. leaked. You you got it because it was leaked, correct? Yeah, yeah, it was leaked to the public. There's um, yeah, it, it wasn't leaked to me personally. But I mean, but it, was, that's, it wasn't published. It was leaked, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's ne- it's never been officially published. Um, for precisely that reason, and you saw this right at the start. Actually, there's this fascinating thing I discovered in Anslinger's archives, where when um, when they're making the initial proposal to ban cannabis. He wrote to, I think it was 30 doctors saying, you know, what do you, what do you, you know, what do you think? And 29 of them wrote back and said, no, this is not a good idea. Don't do that. And one of them wrote back and said, well, maybe. And he, of course, published the one and ignored the other 29. <laughs> There's another scientist who wrote to him, Dr. Ball, whose name was, he said something like, you know, well, maybe you're right, but I think we should fund some scientific studies to figure this out. This can be tested. And Anslinger wrote back and said, I think these were his exact words, the time for temporizing is over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just it's it, it's it, it's crazy to re- the thing that to me was so fascinating about working on chasing the screen for so long is it's crazy to realize so many of the things we've been told are just not true you know and then to go to places where they've done the exact opposite and to see the results i'll tell you about uh, if you like about portugal you know so portugal in the year 2000 had one of the worst drug problems in europe one percent of the population was addicted to heroin and which is kind of incredible yeah and that's Every lot, year, yeah. yeah, it's an extraordinary, you know, one in a hundred people. That's extraordinary. And um, every year they tried the drug war way more. They arrested and imprisoned more people. And every year the problem got worse. And one day the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together and basically said that we can't go on like this. What are we going to do? 
And they decided to do something really radical, something no one had done since the start of the drug war. They basically said, oh, should we get someone to actually look at the scientific evidence? So they, they set up this panel of scientists and doctors led by this amazing man called Dr. Hua Gulao, who I got to know. And they basically said, look, you guys go away, figure out what would solve this problem. And we've agreed in advance, we'll do whatever you recommend. So it just took it out of politics. And uh, I don't think they thought the panel would recommend what it did, to be fair, but they did stay, stick to their word. So the panel went away, looked at all the evidence, things like Rat Park, what we were talking about before, and they came back and said, decriminalise all of it. Decriminalise all drugs from cannabis to crack. But, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on ruining addicts, on stigmatising them, shaming them, arresting them, imprisoning them, and spend it instead on turning their lives around. And it's interesting, it's not what the kind of stuff Chris Christie's talking about. They do a bit of residential rehab, they do a bit of psychological support, there's some value in that. But the biggest thing they did was the opposite of what we do. We give addicts criminal records that make it harder for them to reconnect to the society. What they did was set up a programme of job subsidy for addicts. So say you used to be a mechanic, they'll go to a garage and they'll say, employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. The goal was to say to every addict in Portugal, we love you, we value you, we're on your side, we want you back. And the results, when, by the time I went, it was um, 13 years since, the, uh, since this experiment began. It's 15 years now. The results are really clear. Injecting drug use fell in Portugal by 50%, 5-0%. Overdose massively fell. Deaths among addicts from all causes massively fell. One of the ways you know it worked so well is I went and interviewed a guy called Juan Figuera, who led the opposition to the decriminalisation at the time. He was the top drug cop in Portugal. And he said to me, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. And he talks about how he felt really ashamed that he'd spent so long arresting and imprisoning drug addicts. It's worth just saying as a code to that, the difference between decriminalisation and legalisation. So what they did in Portugal is they stopped punishing users, but you still have to go to criminals to get your drugs. Legalisation is where you open up some legal route. So it's like decriminalisation shuts down Orange is the New Black and legalisation shuts down Breaking Bad. <laughs> so I don't want to present... Portugal is just the solution because it doesn't deal with what I think is the most devastating aspect of it, but it does deal with a really significant, significant aspect. And it does show you that you can end all criminal penalties for drug use. And if what you do next is smart, you will see less addiction, not more. Now, they are almost out of time. So there's a couple of things I want to make sure we hit that I think are crucial uh, ideas in your book. One, you kind of uh, broached on a, a, a few minutes ago, but – it's, I think it's very important that what the iron law of prohibition uh, and what that is and how that means that the nature of the drug market under prohibition is not what it looks like when the government gets out of either complete prohibition or does something partial legalization or decriminalization. I'm so glad you asked about that because it's it can sound a bit wonky but I think it's one of the worst harms of the drug war. Um, and I've been trying to find a way to explain it in a way that doesn't sound really wonky but the best way to explain it is Imagine, so the best way to explain it is the day before alcohol is banned in the United States, most popular drinks by far were beer and wine. A week after alcohol prohibition ends, most popular drinks are beer and wine. In between, you could not get beer or wine. The, the only alcoholic drinks available were things like whiskey, vodka and moonshine. And you think, well, why would that be? Why would banning alcohol change the way people drank alcohol? It didn't change what people wanted. It changed what they could get. And the way to understand that is to imagine if you or me, let's imagine you or me wanted to get, you know, the nearest bar to the Cato Institute website, uh, Cato Institute uh, offices. Imagine we wanted to get uh, enough alcohol for everyone in that bar tonight to be happy. And we had to smuggle it in a wagon from the Canadian border or the Mexican border. If we fill our wagon with beer, we're only going to get enough alcohol for what, 100 people? If we fill it with vodka, we're going to get enough alcohol for thousands of people. When you ban a substance and it has to be smuggled, you suddenly get a premium on getting the biggest possible kick into the smallest possible space. And the reason why that's really damaging is because we, we don't want people to be using the most extreme form of a drug, right? Um, the, the, if you think about it, so for example, you'll often get, uh, Carly Fiorina said it in one of the, um, the Republican debates, you know, um, I'm, I'm saying this from memory, so I may be getting it slightly wrong, but something like, well, cannabis today, yeah, she said it to Jeb Bush, didn't she? Cannabis today is not like the cannabis that Jeb Bush was smoking in the 60s. It's much stronger. The implication being that's why we can't legalize it. Well, she's right. It is much stronger. But that's because of the prohibition, not despite it, that the, um, most people who smoke cannabis don't want to smoke super skunk. Just like most people who drink alcohol, go into your bar in D.C., 
very few people will be drinking vodka and no one's going to be drinking absinthe, right? Um, most or people Everclear want, for that matter, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Most people want mild forms of their drug. This is really devastating when you look at opiates and coca products. Like we were saying before, the most popular way of consuming opiates was, was a syrup. Very mild amount of opiates in it. When you banned um, heroin, that just vanishes. When you ban opiates, that just vanishes and the only form of heroin you can get is, is, is the only form of opiates you can get is heroin. Think about uh, coca products. The only, uh, the most popular way of consuming them was in tea prior to them being banned. Very mild. You know, it's more like caffeine than it is like cocaine. Um, that just disappears. Has anyone even heard of coca tea now? Um, outside, you know, Peru and Bolivia, no one. Um, most popular way of consuming it becomes powder cocaine and the oat because it's the only way of doing it and then when you have that huge crackdown uh, led by reagan in the 80s uh and the huge crackdown on cocaine smuggling what do you get and even more Crack. intense exactly an even more intense even more compacted form of cocaine crack that is an invention of the iron law of prohibition Fascinating. That's very. It's incredibly important. Um, so I think that for the for the for closing out here, there, I think we can tie a couple of these together in a great thematic way. One is I'd like to hear the the, the sort of end of the full element of the Billy Holiday story, and then how that ties into Harry Anslinger and the end of his life, and what happened at the end of his life uh, with his involvement with drug dealing and drug use. Yeah. So. When Billy Holiday says, I'm going to sing my song, whatever you want, Anslinger resolves to destroy her. First person he sends to stalk, he hated employing African Americans, but you couldn't really send a white guy into Harlem to stalk Billy Holiday. He also really importantly true. hated jazz music too. That's what he thought. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm obsessed with the things that Harry Anslinger said about <laughs> jazz. He said there was like the primitive jungles of Africa. So he, when it's he, done right, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> He regarded it as like uh, it's so funny the memos that his agent sent him about jazz but it was so amazing they literally things like um, he said it was like the kind of deranged gibberish of a of a, a dying man like he, <laughs> and he quite what he did is he quoted the the lyrics and he'd say this is how marijuana makes you feel so there's one song where he says uh, when he gets the notion he thinks he can walk across the ocean and as he writes. They do believe that on marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> so he obsessively hated the jazz world and he wanted to destroy all of it. And um, so he sends this guy, Jimmy Fletcher, to stalk Billy Holiday. Uh, he spends years following her around Harlem. Billy Holiday was so amazing, Jimmy Fletcher fell in love with her. And his whole life he was ashamed of what he did. He busts her. She's sent to prison. She spends 18 months in prison. She doesn't sing a word in prison. But what happens next is the cruelest thing. She gets out. And you needed a license to perform anywhere where alcohol was served. And Anslinger makes sure she doesn't get that license. Her friend Yolanda Bavan said to me, what is the cruelest thing you can do to a person is to take away the thing they love. You know, they take away singing from Billie Holiday. She relapses. She collapses one day. She, she relapses on both very heavy alcohol use and heroin use. And she's taken to hospital in New York and they diagnose... Actually, the first hospital won't even take her because she's a heroin addict. Second hospital on the way in, she says to one of her friends, they're going to kill me in there. Don't let them, they're going to kill me. Because she was convinced that Anslinger's men were going to come for her. She was diagnosed with liver cancer, quite advanced liver cancer. And she starts to go into withdrawal because she hasn't got any heroin in the hospital. And one of her friends, Maylie Dufty, managed to insist that she was given um, methadone. And she started to recover a little bit. Um, and then Anslinger's men cut off the, the heroin after 10 days. That was the limit that Anslinger had put in place. Um, and she died uh, a couple of days later. They, she, when she died, she was handcuffed to her hospital bed. They didn't let in her friends to see her. They, didn't, they took away her record player. They took away her candies. One of her friends told the BBC that she looked like she had been violently wrenched from life. And I think that tells you so much about what the drug war is about, about how it destroys addicts, how it's about race. At the same time that Harry Anslinger found out that Billie Holiday was a heroin addict, he found out that Judy Garland, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, was a heroin addict. He recommended that she take slightly longer vacations and he reassured the studio she was going to be fine. T spot the difference, yeah. right? Which is sort of what he did at the end of his life too with a, a certain senator. <laughs> so... Um, this is what we know from, from what Anslinger himself wrote and what he told his co-author. So he found out that Joe McCarthy was using uh, opiates, not heroin, but opiates, uh, which were then still available. And Harry Anslinger, not surprisingly, loved Joe McCarthy. And he went to Joe McCarthy and said, you know, Senator, you need to stop this. And McCarthy said no. And so Anslinger 
arranged that he could get his opiates legally from a pharmacist in DC. It, you know, bear in mind, he had destroyed the doctors who had wanted to do that. So when it came to someone that Harry Anslinger cared about, he turns into a legalizer like everyone else. Later in his life, when he, uh, he became quite ill with angina, he himself started using uh, opiates uh, that were prescribed by his doctor. And I sometimes try to imagine, you know, what did Harry Anslinger think the first time he used opiates and he felt them kind of washing through his system? Did he think about Billie Holiday? Did he think about the doctors he had destroyed for giving people this drug? You know, did he, did he think about all the lives he'd ruined to stop people doing this thing that he was now doing? Now, for those uh, who are familiar with your past transgressions, uh, I, I, where they can go to look up all this stuff, because you've said a lot of things that might be shocking to many people because they've never heard it before. But you have all this documented. So where can they go to learn more about this? Yeah, well, if they go to www.chasingthescream.com and it's scream as in, ah, not scream as in the screen you look at to watch television. Um, they can hear interviews with all the people that I've talked about in this um, interview, uh, all the people I interviewed. Um, so uh, they can hear the audio of all of that, all the quotes from the book that were said to me, you can hear the audio. There's massive and extensive footnotes that I'd recommend people kind of follow up to look at the the, the trail for the history of this stuff because it is – it's shocking and it should a lot of this stuff should be should be better known and uh i think it's important that we know this because it doesn't have to continue right we, we have a choice about this a, a big majority of americans agree with the statement the war on drugs has failed and the one thing you can say in defense of the war on drugs is we have given it a fair shot right the united states has spent a hundred years and a trillion dollars and killed hundreds of thousands of people and at the end of all that you can't even keep drugs out of your prisons where well, you have a walled perimeter that you pay people to walk around the whole time. That gives you some sense of how much this war is going to work. There are alternatives. I've seen them in practice. We can, you know, you can look at them for yourself. We can see the results. There is a better way waiting for us if, when we're ready to choose it. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.